snowy night. She came back looking a little annoyed, but also shrugged her shoulders as if to say that such is life. I could see over her shoulder that it had begun to snow outside. The snow was so white and her hair so black. That's what dung is. It's like how a few mosquitoes will always get into your mosquito net no matter how hard you try to prevent them. Or like how even if you try to seal a wall with plaster three or four times, water will always leak through. Dung just happens. What caused me to fall so completely for him? It was the words he spoke. I just loved the words he would speak to me. Those calm, warm words he would speak as he would hold me all night. We made a promise, him and I, the first night we spent together. We will meet two times a week only, no calls to the office. But the biggest promise was that we would only see each other for two and a half years. The time he had left at his job in town. When that was over, we would never meet again. For two and a half years, we loved each other completely. And after that, he went back to Seoul. I haven't seen him once since. That's why I call our love a success. He called today. It was the first time since we separated. The story was not finished, even after the successful ending. This must also be the reason she brought up this old story in the first place. The snow continued to fall and fall, as if it were going to take the whole world back in time. Snowy Night, written by Han Chang-hoon. She came back looking a little annoyed, but also shrugging her shoulders as if to say, that such is life. I could see over her shoulder that it had begun to snow outside. The snow was so white and her hair so black. I felt sure that someone must have purposely created this scene of differing extremes. She had just laid out a table for a group of rowdy customers, so I figured it would be difficult for her to jump back into her story, like trying to run after your sweat dries. But in no time at all, the woman picked up where she left off. I was just telling you about that Macaulay bar, right? Maybe that's why. But while I was frying the fish, a song just popped into my head. I don't know why it keeps doing that. You know that song? I go a little ways, and there's a train crossing, a train crossing. And when the train passes, that song. Do you know it? I told her that I knew the song was called A Portrait of Youth and that it was sung by a group of two or three girls called the Young Lovers. Though now that I thought about it, I don't think they were that young. But anyway, they had kind of rough, husky voices that went well with the song. The woman replied that yes, she thought that was the name of the group, and asked me to sing as much as I could remember. Having been the listener so long, my mouth felt stiff, and I started to mumble the first few lines. Once I started, I remembered the whole song. I go a little ways, and suddenly there's the shore, the shore. I crossed this small island and came all the way because I thought you would be here. We were lonely when we met. We were lonely after we separated. Lonely people should never forget. People who have cried so many tears should never forget each other. I go a little ways, and suddenly there's a train crossing, a train crossing. I came all the way because I thought you would be there after the train passed. I go a little ways, and there's a bench, a bench. I came all the way only because I thought I could hear that voice my ears know so well. She spoke again. Right, that's how it went, that train crossing. You know, in the morning, the train used to go by at 7, 8.40, and oh, it's so hazy now. Back then, I used to know the times by heart. 
But anyway, even if I forgot, I would hear the rattling of the wheels as the train passed. There was a train from an old line that would go by on its way to Kwangju at 6.40 in the evening. Whenever it would go by, I made sure not to look, because even with the guard stick down, you could see to the other side. It would be clear whether his car was there or not. I wouldn't look. I didn't want to see if it was not there. I would just ignore it and focus on wiping tables or preparing food until I would hear it rattle away. Then I would peek out there, like this, just like in the song. I thought he would be there after the train passed. After the last train car slid past, I would see his car there. A dark gray Elentra GLI. Not even a GLSI. Just a GLI. A car with gentle eyes. The Avanta has the sharp, fierce eyes of an angry woman, you know. But that car looked so gentle. It looked just like its owner. Hey, ma'am, <clears throat> should we just get out of here? An old man, pretending to have gone out and come back in from the bathroom, stood staring through the partly open door to our room. No doubt he had looked me over before I had turned around to look at him. Looking a little annoyed, she said, Eat and stay a little longer, and stood up with a grunt. Having just sung a song of lost love, I felt compelled to lift my own glass. You can't leave us alone like that, the man protested. Oh, stop acting like a man whose wife ran off on him, the woman said. Hey, he is here by himself, you know. That's ridiculous. Next time we'll come one at a time, too, then. This fish came in today. You haven't even touched it. The woman tried to change the subject. How is it going to taste when it's just us men sitting stiffly around it? I was able to hear all this through the door. They were jealous of me, these men, with their wrinkle-free suits and their few remaining hairs neatly combed over their balding heads. I could guess that they were recently retired workers from a nearby government office. In fact, the fish on my plate also looked quite fresh, like maybe a lazy fisherman, after hearing his wife nag him all day, went down to the shore and pulled this right up. The silver scales were incredibly clear. I pulled off a piece of gray flesh from the fish's back and ate it. Let's order some coffee from Jung Chi House, one of the men said. Apparently they were still feeling jealous of me. If you want coffee, I can make some for you, the woman offered. Who orders coffee for the taste? It's because we don't like your face. I just noticed a new thing working there with big breasts who delivers. Let's have her come over here for an hour. Look, it's snowing now. What are you going to do if on her way over the weight of her chest makes her slip and fall? <laughs> Wouldn't mind seeing that. Don't waste your money on ordering coffee. Just go ahead and feel mine. The men burst into laughter. The woman is clearly more skilled than most at handling men. Well, she did start up a Macaulay bar with her bare hands, and now has this restaurant. Though I don't know if she owns it or is leasing it, it is clear that it is strong and well-built, like it could go for another hundred years. Plus, judging from how many government workers come to eat here, she is clearly benefiting from more than just her cooking skill. What do you think you're doing putting your hand down there without any notice? The woman was now saying. This hand has even gone into my mother-in-law's crotch, a man said. You're shameless. I knew you would be. So today I went to the market and bought a tight pair of panties to wear. No opening. What brand? Independence Gate. What gate has no opening? You push a gate and it opens. Yeah, but like I said, it's not just any gate. It's Independence Gate, our national memorial. Not just anyone can just open it. <laughs> oh, wow. I could tell from their laughter that the woman had stood and lifted up her skirt. Their jealousy had disappeared. These were 6,000 won for one pair and 10,000 for two. I bought two pair to wear depending on the customers. One tight pair like this and one a little looser. You're saying those things were only 5,000 won? Then it should cost that much for you take them off. The product has its own price. What are you talking about? The price of the packaging is different. Hmm. I think the price of the product is usually pretty similar to the price of the packaging, one of the men urged. 
if you think like that, you may end up eating a rotten fruit, as long as it looks good on the outside. Look, ma'am, time has not just affected us. At your age, you should do everything for customers like us that come in here. I might look pretty weathered up top, but down below, I'm still 20. If I go to the bathhouse, all the ladies gather around and ask how my top and bottom have aged so differently. Okay, the show's over. The men were silent. No doubt you will curse this restaurant if you are so drunk you slip and fall on the ice outside. So don't just drink, eat some food too. That fish was expensive, the woman said. They surely enjoyed the sights, while I had fun listening to the scene. Then, after a few more stories, someone suggested one more drink. Another said they should just go already, and eventually they finished up and left. The night had grown deeper. The snow fell more fully. The woman came back. How's the food? The men around here can be a little tough, she said. I told her she is tougher than the men, and she laughed lightly before staring for a long time at the dizzying footprints the men had left in the snow. The footprints quickly covered themselves with a white cloth and disappeared into the ground. She then continued her story. That man was transferred down here to work in quality control at the factory. The first time he came to my bar, he was with a group of regulars from there. There was nothing special about him. It was like it didn't matter if he was there or not, you know? If he had come with four people, the only thing to worry about regarding him was if we had room for a fifth. He came with them twice, just sitting there, bored as can be, and then he'd go. And then one day he started slipping in by himself. But really, it's not unusual for people to come to a bar by themselves, is it? At that, she emptied her soju glass. Every last drop slipped down between her red lips. I met my husband early. There is always a feeling of something severely lacking the first time you do something. No matter what it is. I guess because it's literally your first time. I had lived so innocently up until then. And then suddenly I had a son. I fought day and night with my husband, and we ended up getting divorced. I hated him, and he hated me. I was left with nothing but my son and my son's hungry mouth. Didn't even come out of it with a penny. For a while, I worked as a kitchen helper at a restaurant, but it wasn't enough. I had no way to support us with my wages. Whether we lived or died, I wanted to have my own shop. So I took a loan with heavy interest and got that Makali bar with the room attached. It was a lot of work, obviously. I did it all myself. I worked nonstop for three years and was able to pay off the debt. I was so focused on my work during that time, I never noticed if one man came in or a dozen. That man would come in alone, looking a little pouty, drink one bottle of Macaulay, and then leave listlessly. Every day. He was just so dull, sitting there asking all sorts of questions. What kind of spices I used in the tofu salad, where I bought the Macaulay, how old my kid was, what time I opened in the morning, those type of things. And then he'd just sit there silently, smoke, and fiddle with the dishcloth. He was a really weak drinker. After just one bottle, he looked like he would pass out. Just totally unremarkable. She stopped again and clinked her glass strongly against mine, neatly picked up a piece of fish and ate it. I refilled her glass and she refilled mine. Have you heard the saying, spending time with someone doesn't build dung? Sleeping next to them does? It's absolutely true. Back then there was a group of men who were building a silo nearby for the farmer's co-op. They would eat here and were in the habit of stopping by every night for a drink. They were there that night making a lot of noise. Apparently one of the carpenters had gotten to a fight with a bricklayer, and they came in that night to smooth things over with a drink, but ended up fighting all over again. It was a madhouse. They grabbed each other by the collar, pushed each other, pulled each other, knocked over tables, broke windows. You get the picture. I kicked out all the workers and was closing up early when he came. He had been drinking a little in the city and felt like he didn't want to go straight home, so he stopped by for one more drink. What could I do? He was a regular customer. He was a calm guy. But after just half a bottle, he passed out, falling dead asleep on the table. 
No matter how much I tried to wake him up to make him leave, he couldn't get up. Even trying to get up, he just fell down again and lay on the floor. There was nothing else I could do. I brought him to my room to sleep. It was like he was dead. My son was in his first year of middle school then. Actually, he'll be coming home from the military any day now. He was majoring in computers and went after finishing his first year. Anyway, I put my sleeping son between us and we went to sleep. Just as the train rattled past, he opened his mouth. Oh, that man. He had used his head. He wasn't really drunk, just pretending. He didn't want to leave. He wanted to sleep next to me. There goes the train. That means it's already one o'clock. If you're awake, then please leave. Do you know where that train goes? It's on its way to Suncheon. Is Suncheon the last stop? It goes all the way to either Busan or Busanjin Station. The first time I went to Busan, I was 20. I still haven't been. I've been to Daegu. I want to forget everything and ride that train. Go ahead. I don't want to ride it alone. So? I want to ride it with you. What are you saying right now? I put you up because I couldn't just send a regular customer out into the night drunk. I really wish I could ride that night train with you. She remained quiet a while before starting again. Nothing happened. He didn't even touch my hand. We just spent the whole night talking on and on about this and about that. Stories about his childhood. A story about a time in high school when he followed a girl and got slapped by her. A story about a time when he was studying to retake the college entrance exams, went to Pusan's Heun Beach for the day, and was so starving he begged a store for free ice cream. A story about when he burned his army uniform roasting chestnuts. A story about how he washed 17 army blankets with face soap. A story about when he almost froze to death at Songni Mountain's Munjang Day. Stories about movies, about novels, about music. I don't know how he had so many stories. This time I clinked my glass against hers and she refilled us both. That's what dung is. It's like how a few mosquitoes will always get into your mosquito net no matter how hard you try to prevent them. Or like how even if you try to seal a wall with plaster three or four times, water will always leak through. Dung just happens. Like I said, we never even touched fingers. We didn't fall asleep until he left at dawn. Just because, in the whole wide world, we laid under one roof, in one room, because we stayed awake all night together. Because of this, we were attached. He became more than just another person to me. Having said this, she grinned at me like an older sister who had hid something of her little brother's. The light seemed to sparkle off the end of her shapely nose and the lines turning up from the ends of her eyes grew longer. Honestly, that man wasn't very strong and didn't have much technique either. Just as I was getting going and thinking about going up a little more, he was panting heavily and coming down from the mountain. Apparently, he couldn't get me to peek with him. <laughs> for me, once my fire gets started, it can go for a long time. But I was never able to do that with him. At most, two times in one night. He would get up and come right back down, gasping as if he'd carried a whole building on his back. But still, I liked him and was so happy with him. What was so great about him? He had little virility and was not bold. You can probably guess, but I am not really someone who likes the manly types. A few aggressive men from around here can come at me, and I don't get scared at all. Me, a woman like that, liked that man. What was it? What caused me to fall so completely for him? It was the words he spoke. I just loved the words he would speak to me. Those calm, warm words he would speak as he would hold me all night. Those words about the several days he walked the streets, covered in fallen leaves, unable to forget that high school girl. Those whispered words as he would look into my eyes and tell me of their color. As he would caress my hair and tell me about the color of the sunset at Chesukgang. 
He told me a story about a man who would beat his wife, and then one day a traveling monk came by to ask for food, and told the couple the husband beat the wife because in their previous life, the husband was an ox and the wife was the owner, so he was making up for all the abuse she gave to the ox. But in order to even the score, the monk told the husband he should switch from a stick to a thatch broom when he hit his wife. So the man said to me, we must have been in a great love affair in our past lives, too. I remember how he held my hand while he told me all these things. Who is there to speak those fun and truthful words to me now? We also listened to a lot of music. He listened to that song you sang earlier. But there was one like this, too. I like you totally. Just stay by my side like this. There are so many stories I want to share with you but the time is flowing by. Far away, a whistle is blowing. Someone is leaving. That song was exactly how I felt. I would hold him tight and sing those words, and he would put his lips up to my ear and sing them with me. Just hearing that song would make my body melt. We both loved music, but when we went to sleep at night, we wouldn't just listen to anything. We would mainly listen to Ballad for Having a Son. I laughed as I made out she was joking about the piano song, Ballade pour Adeline, and she laughed loudly in response. I don't know why poets write poetry. We have pop songs. What more could there be to say? I like you totally, like the song. I just like you. I like you a lot. I really like you. She asked me for a cigarette. The smoke seemed hide a while in some deep place of the woman's chest. I smoked for a long time after opening the bar, but after I met him, I no longer had the desire, so I quit. But every once in a while, when I'm having these kind of plaintive thoughts, I will smoke again. Unfortunately for her, having waited for so long to be sunk so deep in thought, she was only able to smoke about half of that cigarette before having to get up. Customers who had been in the room near the back had called out to tell her they were leaving. She gave the cigarette to me and stood up. Oh my, have you finished eating? I was too busy talking today and lost track of time, she said, her slippers leaving tracks in the quietly piling snow. I picked up her cigarette. The filter had a touch of lipstick on it, giving me the feeling that I was touching something private of hers. I raised my eyes high and took in its full scent as I smoked in the world of heavy snowflakes. The line of smoke rising up to the place from which the snow departed was like longed-for memories appearing in their present form, or like the choreography of time. The taste of lipstick was so strong that a sharp fishy taste filled my mouth. Then I thought that perhaps for the woman, putting on makeup every morning without a choice, putting on lipstick, just to have it rub off slowly throughout the day onto things like cigarette filters as she smokes, could cause her to ruminate over something yearned for, something poisonous. In that case, then that fishy taste, that dull tingling, is something like the smell of the man who has gone so far away. I bought new underwear today, but the quality is not very good. Once I pull them up, they don't come back down again. The woman was speaking to someone at the door. We made a big effort to come here and see you today, but it's a no-go, huh? The voice replied. <laughs> the fruit ripens the longer it sits. The woman tried to joke. We came because of the promise you made last time. You said come back on a snowy day. Oh, oh, I did. That's right. I'm hurt. Here, why don't you each drink this first? Well, I don't want to. You came to my place. You should drink one cup each. I boiled it all afternoon. See, this is why we always end up coming back here. She gives the disease, and she gives the medicine. I do sell alcohol, but I don't want to totally ruin your bodies. The young men each drank a glass of mugwort tea, and then, as if given a boost of energy, grabbed the woman and off they went, each young man holding one of her wrists. They quickly disappeared past the fence. 
I leaned against the wall and stared at the door through which everyone had left. On the other side of the fence, snow embroidered the branches of the tuya tree before falling down again. I felt empty and cozy at the same time. The woman I was sharing a conversation with was stolen away by other men. I knew, though, that as the owner, she would have to return sometime. On top of that, I still had to pay for the things I had eaten. I suddenly realized that the lady helping in the kitchen had gone home as well, and I was left alone to watch over the empty restaurant. The snow fell and fell. Staring at the endlessly sinking flakes, I drank another glass. Having left without saying when she would return, it seemed as though she would appear at any moment, shaking snow off herself, but the door she disappeared through remained desolate. It was as though she had left me like the man who spoke those warm words had left her. Sitting in that empty restaurant, watching the snow falling, I thought about the story of the curse of the dragon's magic orb. How, once you have it, great and marvelous things happen to you, making you rich. But it is not something you want to hold on to, because if you do not pass it on to someone less fortunate and more miserable than yourself, you get a disease that shrivels your body, and, despite your riches, you are continually pulled into the world of desperate poverty. So, I had thought that perhaps the woman, after sitting down a passerby and prattling on about all the things that had been building up inside her, was now skipping lightly down the street somewhere, happy to be rid of it. But as soon as I had that thought, I suddenly felt that maybe all her talks of ballads for conceiving a son and tight-fitting panties was like a dance of seduction to ensure me. Or maybe she was like a comedy actor, who after making everyone clutch their sides with laughter, ends up stumbling home alone down a dark alleyway, liquor bottle in hand. After her footprints had been fully buried in snow, she returned. More than being glad to be back, she felt sorry for trapping me in her restaurant for so long a time. I gave my simple report as guard of the place, how a few men who could hardly walk came looking for her, but left saying they would come another day. Actually, I had promised those boys I would go to a karaoke room with them, and it just so happened to be today. Those young boys just dragged me along, but while I was there I sang that song, I Love You Totally that one. And the other one, go a little ways. That one too. Uh, one boy kept hugging me from behind. My bra is all turned around. I told her she did well. We used to call snow like this rice snow. The woman stared down for a long time at the snowflakes falling onto her footprints before she spoke again. When I was young, we lived in the mountains. Really deep in the hilly mountains, no one would have guessed there was a tiny village there. It was the kind of place that as soon as you noticed the leaves starting to change colors, it would begin to snow. We couldn't do any rice farming or raise any pigs or cows. We just had a few sloping fields and grapevines. So during the winter, we would get by eating radish leaves and pegangi. Do you know pegangi? <laughs> it's been so long I almost forgot about it just suddenly popped into my head. I laughed as well and told her that being from the country, I did know about it, that it was dried sweet potato. You seem younger than me, but you know about that, huh? Wow, you could chew on that stuff all day, which is good when you're so hungry. It was so hard that after eating it, your jaw would be stiff, but it was still pretty good. By the middle of winter, we would usually run out of that as well. You wouldn't believe how hungry we were. Even though we had a house and a family, we were pure and simple bums. Beggars. Our skin would crack and bleed. Can you imagine it? I didn't need to look in a mirror. Just by looking at my brother and sister, I knew how I looked. There was one year that was especially cold and snowy. We would gulp down a bowl of radish leaf soup but as soon as we had, our stomachs would growl again. We were already hungry. That day, the snow was falling like this. Oh, look, rice is falling. Think how sad that is. 
My sister said this, leaning against the wall as if dead, wiping snot with the back of her hand. See, see, rice is falling. But it was true. Snowflakes the size of a fist were falling silently down. It really looked like clumps of rice falling out of the sky. All we needed was a spoon and maybe a little salt. My sister and I crouched down in the snow and called out to each other. Rice balls, rice cake, popped rice. We didn't even feel our feet freezing there in the snow. That day was so cold the bedpan froze over. My brother finally passed out from hunger, and that's when my father finally decided he was going to go out and catch a rabbit or a deer. Having traveled back to a time even further in the past than her old lover, she asked for another cigarette. Though she was lighting the flame here in the present, her thoughts were still years away in the past. Silent, yet clearly visible, looking so cozy, but when touched is actually cold. That's exactly what snow is, and her too at that moment. If the blizzard continued for another four days, then it seemed she could travel back hundreds of years in her mind and tell a warm, interesting story of a time she met a penniless man on the street. We waited so long for our father to come back from hunting for meat. We sat there, starving, just waiting for the rabbit meat we expected him to bring, but he didn't come. You know, things always take longer the more you wait for them. The sun slid down the ridge of the mountains before being swallowed up by them, leaving the village in darkness. We waited and waited, until finally, just as we were giving up, he appeared. He left at dawn and came back when the moon was high in the sky. As soon as he opened the fence gate, he called out my brother's name and collapsed. Of course, the first thing we wondered is what he brought back. We noticed it there on his back. It wasn't a rabbit or a deer, but there was some wild beast hanging limply from his shoulders. We pulled his frozen body inside, gave him warm water, and massaged his body until he got the color back in his face. What is this, Dad? Wolf. <clears throat> it's a wolf. Get water boiling. <laughs> the whole family gathered around that night as we burnt off the fur, boiled the meat, and ate that animal. I put a cigarette in my mouth, too, and asked her what wolf meat tastes like, but she looked at me as if to say to keep listening. The following day, people from the next village and a few from our village came to our house. They said they came to catch the thief. We had no idea what they were talking about. What happened was our father didn't see any rabbits while hunting, but he couldn't just come home. So he went to a house on the outskirts of a nearby village and killed their dog. No matter how careful you were, those were hungry times, and there was no hiding the smell of burning dog hair. Trying to not get caught, my father had put that dog on his back and walked over the hills and mountains coming back home, but unfortunately it stopped snowing the moment he killed that dog. So he was caught and everyone found out. God, those people demanded money for their dog, and just as they did, it started snowing again. <laughs> they finally left, taking every cent we had. That night, the snow felt so much colder. Why did I start telling you this? I told her it was because of the snow, and trying to impress her, added that maybe snow is the heavens, trying to tell a story. That put a smile on her face. You sound just like that man. Hmm. I learned how warm winter can be when I was in love with him. During the winter, I would listen to his stories as he held me in his chest, and every once in a while would have to go out to change the briquettes in the furnace while the snow fell like it is tonight. I couldn't believe how warm those orange glowing briquettes were, and his chest was just as warm. I would stare at the falling snow for a while before washing my hands and going back to him. He would wipe my hands, lick them, warm them up. <laughs> Life can be so warm during winter. That man. I loved him. I think that our love was a success. I mean, even though we separated, we didn't fail. When talking about love, it's not important if you stay together or separate. You know, no matter how frustrated I am, 
If I think of that man, my heart calms down and I end up smiling. When we were together, we would hold each other and talk, and that was fun. But if he just pops into my head, I laugh and smile. I mean, why would I think of him and miss him if he was always next to me? But I feel like our love is just as successful as it would have been had we been married for a long time. Her face looked half satisfied, but also half forlorn. I couldn't blame her for what she was feeling. I blurted out, asking, isn't it kind of hard to see it as a success just because everything was so great during that short time? The snow was still falling. We never got caught. She laughed and smiled, just like she said. I had no attachments to worry about, but it wasn't that way for him. He had a wife and two kids. He wasn't the type of person who would end things with them to come be with me, and I was against that anyway. I never wanted to live with someone as a couple. Of course, I was a woman who ran a bar, too. But anyway, that man really loved his wife and kids. They say love can be shared differently, and it's true. He loved them separately, and me separately. I understood the way he felt, which is probably why he loved me the way he did. Anyway, we had our relationship for three years and were certainly never caught. But we were never suspected either. His wife had no idea I even existed. They say three things you can never hide are sneezes, poverty, and love. But we did. We hid our love. She filled our glasses again, but just stared down blankly at them. Behind her, the night snow fell in a triangle beneath the streetlight. With the eaves framing the scene, it looked like the backdrop in a theater, and I suddenly felt like I was part of a one-act play. The reason why our love is a success is quite simply because we played by the rules. She spoke as if giving her last testament, or as if she were revealing a secret she had held dear so long. We made a promise, him and I, the first night we spent together. We will meet two times a week only. No calls to the office. When we send a phone number to the beeper, we'll use the number of the phone booth next to the real estate office. Those types of things. But the biggest promise was that we would only see each other for two and a half years. The time he had left at his job in town. When that was over, we would never meet again. Just hold the memories dear. And that is what happened. For two and a half years, we loved each other completely. And after that, he went back to Seoul. I haven't seen him once since. That's why I call our love a success. I thought she indeed looked like someone who had succeeded at something. And so, to congratulate the two of them on their success, I poured two more drinks. She first shook her head to say she had drunk enough, but finally motioned to say one last drink and lifted the glass. She stared at the rising liquid as I poured it for her and finally spoke again. He called today. The snow continued to fall and fall, as if it were going to take the whole world back in time. It seemed that if I were to open the front door right now, then that car slipping on the snowy road, or the girl in the black boots walking carefully down the street with a cake box in hand, or the noisy high school girls, or the young men having a wrestle in the snow, would all be buried and disappear into the snow. The city hall building would also be leaning over like a half-destroyed ancient ruin. I thought perhaps a seven-year ice age was just beginning, or could even now be coming to a close. The snow even reflected on my empty glass. I couldn't decide if I had become drunk on the soju, drunk on the snow, or drunk on the woman's story, but I didn't care either. Her eyes looked empty, like a person feeling the emptiness of success. It was the first time since we separated. The story was not finished, even after the successful ending. This must also be the reason she brought up this old story in the first place. I heard his voice for the first time in seven years. He said he was at a crematory up in the mountains and that it was snowing. I think at that point it had begun to snow here as well. He didn't say who died. He wasn't talking, but I could tell without seeing him that he was crying. He simply said it was snowing and then cried quietly for a long time, asked if I was okay, 
then again was quiet for a while, mentioned how my number hadn't changed, and then again, quiet. It was clear that something bad happened to someone close to him, but when I asked what happened, he just said it was snowing. Perhaps the snow was falling to create someone's grave. I couldn't pry for any more information. I just listened to the sound of his breathing. Listening to it, it felt just like he was talking quietly next to me. I felt so bad. A person I love was having a hard time, and there was absolutely nothing I could do for him. I just asked him if he was healthy, how his work was, and then he hung up. I asked her if she made plans to meet him, but she shook her head. You know how much I wanted to ask that. Can we meet? I wanted to say it, and he wanted me to say it as well, but I didn't. I told you, didn't I? I keep the rules. We have already finished. We have succeeded. That's it. Done. Just like I never asked if it was his wife or one of his children who died, and he didn't say anything about it either. That was how our first phone call in seven years went. We just listened to each other breathing. This time, I tried to be the comic actor and said that maybe when there's another funeral, you can listen to each other breathe again. But she didn't laugh. No. I have the feeling that this time we are truly done forever. Maybe after we die, we will find out that we only just now truly succeed in love. Anyway, I kept my promise to him to the end. Keeping that promise is how I show my love for him. Wow. It is really snowing outside tonight. I felt so bad earlier, I didn't want to work. But I couldn't just close the restaurant. That wouldn't have solved anything. I felt like just grabbing a hold of someone and telling them the whole story. And that's when you came in alone. You looked like the perfect person to listen to my story. <sighs> Thanks for listening. I'm going to close now. The roads will be pretty bad as you leave, with all this snow. But this kind of snow won't be cold. Anyway... Have a good night. The woman began to clear the table. Snowy Night is a short story by Han Chang Hoon, published in his collection I Like It Here. Published by Munhak Dongne Publishing Group. The English version is translated by Jason Woodruff and narrated for this audiobook by Marin Griffin. This audiobook was produced in 2021 with the support of the Literature Translation Institute of Korea.